hello everybody. Thanks for coming out this afternoon. Um, I know it's a little blustery and cold, but uh, we appreciate you making the trek over here. Uh, I'm Aaron Merrill with the Mercatus Center, and as part of our mission to put ideas into action, we have invited David R. Henderson to give a presentation today on two papers he recently wrote for the Mercatus Center, uh, copies of which are available in the back if you want to grab them. The first one is on uh, the United States post-war miracle, um, the economic miracle at the end of World War II, and the second one is Canada's budget triumph, which is... Uh, the subject of the Mercatus on policy in front of you, which is a shorter version of the longer paper. And I seem to have lost my bio, so I'm going to wing it from memory. But uh, David R. Henderson is the Associate Professor of Economics at the Graduate School of Business and Public Policy at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. He served on President Reagan's Council of economic advisors, both in the areas of energy policy and health, health policy. policy. Right. And <laughs> he is a regular blogger at the Library of Economics, which is econlib.org. He is also the editor of the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics, which you can find there on the website also, and the author of numerous books um, on a variety of economic topics. He has appeared uh, on C-SPAN, CNN, and numerous other cable shows. His writings have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, Fortune, Financial Times, the New York Times, uh, Wall Street Journal, if I didn't mention that already. And uh, he's here today to give a presentation on practical lessons in cost-cutting and budget slashing and how that can lead to economic growth. So please welcome David R. Henderson. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron, and, and thank you. Just the one thing, I actually have never been in the Financial Times, <laughs> but that was not bad for memory, all those things. And you might think, well, who is this guy who uses a middle initial? What's that all about? It, believe me, it's not, it, it's not what you think. It, there's another David Henderson in Britain who is a free market-oriented economist, and uh, I've been asked to autograph his books, and I bet you he's been asked, asked to autograph mine. So we made an agreement 15 years ago I would use the R, and no one ever pays attention, so we still get confused. I want to start, well, you'll see where I'm going to go. A federal government runs a large deficit. Deficits are so large that the ratio of federal debt to GDP approaches 70%. A constituency of voters have gotten used to large federal spending programs. Does that sound to you like the United States? Well, yes but it also describes Canada in 1993. Yet just 16 years later, Canada's federal debt had fallen from 70% to, of GDP to only 29%. Moreover, every year between 1997 and 2008, Canada's federal government had a budget surplus. In one fiscal year, its surplus was a whopping 1.8% of GDP. To put that in perspective, if the U.S. had that kind of budget surplus today, that would amount to a surplus of 250 billion rather than 1. Point something trillion. There are two things that the Canadian experience shows. That contrary to many Keynesians, you can have substantial cuts in government spending without throwing the economy into recession. Indeed, that was the experience in the 1990s in the United States, where government spending fell by over two percentage points of GDP this was under Clinton, who carried on the Bush-Cheney tax, or, or sorry, defense spending cuts. And then when the Republicans took over Congress and pushed Clinton in the direction of restraint on domestic spending. And of course, we had, in the 1990s, those were years of high growth. The other moral of the story for people who think more about politics, or at least whose bosses think more about politics, is you can cut spending without necessarily losing elections. The Canadian government uh, in introduced their spending cuts in 94, 95, kept on going. They programmed all these cuts through the 90s. And they did lose a few seats in the 97 election, but still retained their majority. How did they do it? Not mainly with tax increases, but mainly with cuts in government spending. So let's look at the setting. Oops. <laughs> Got to learn this. This is Canada's 
federal budget deficit as a percent of GDP from 1968 to 2009. Where it goes below zero, that's a deficit. Where it goes above zero, that's a surplus. You can see who uh, one of the, the villain of the piece is, uh, Canada's longest serving ever Prime Minister, Pierre Trudeau, of the Liberal Party. Mulroney comes in with the Conservative Party. This won't show up here, but let me just explain something with Mulroney. Mulroney did achieve what in Canada and in Britain they call primary budget, budget surplus. What that means is the amount you're spending on programs as distinct from interest on the debt is less than the tax revenue. But because the debt was so high and the interest rates were so high, they still had a massive deficit. So then, Chrétien, Jean Chrétien from Quebec, is also a Liberal Party person, wins the, is, becomes Prime Minister in the election in 93, and the Liberal Party put out something called the Red Book. And it was a book, it was called that because of its, its color, cover was red. And it detailed all their promises, all their plans. And the most important plan in it really was to cut the deficit and ideally get to some kind of surplus. And they actually came in and decided to try to keep their promise. Now, what used to happen with when they put together budgets, was they would go to the various interest groups and they would say, what do you want? And then they'd say, well, we can give you this, we can't give you that, and so on. Instead, what, uh, oh, and there's another person in this piece I need to mention. The Minister of Finance, Paul Martin. Instead, Paul Martin held four regional consultations around the country where he got all the interest groups and the media and normal citizens together so they ended up kind of listening to each other to some extent, fighting each other, and then it wasn't just all the interest groups versus the government. And people were very serious about the debt uh, in Canada, and there were a couple of reasons. One is, just before the 95 budget, which was the second budget they introduced, and it was the one that was started to be aggressive on budget cuts, the Wall Street Journal came out with uh, two stories. One was uh, one in which they call it was an editorial in which they said the Canadian dollar was the northern peso. That caught people's attention. The other was that uh, Moody's had put Canada, Can the Canadian government, on the credit watch two weeks before the budget. So that made people a little more serious. And they came up with real cuts. By the way, I didn't mention this, but I'm originally Canadian. I grew up in a small town in Midwestern Canada, near Winnipeg, and I moved down here in 72 to go to graduate school at UCLA, uh, became a resident alien in uh, 1977, and a citizen in 1986. But I go back to Canada every summer to, to my, the cottage that I inherited from my father. Okay, so now let's look at the cuts. Let me just say something before I show you the cuts. We often have this idea that a cut in government spending means reduce the rate of growth of government spending. But that wasn't their idea. Their idea was to cut government spending in dollar terms. And here we see how they cut. Notice, just to, if you can't see it, right there, there's a 30% cut in, over a, in about a three-year period. And notice some of them were cut more than 30%. Only one thing went up in dollar terms, Indian and Northern Affairs. Everything else was cut, and the total cut, almost 20% in dollar terms. They cut massively transfers to individuals. They cut massively transfers to the provincial governments. And also, one of the cuts I want to I want to just emphasize more than others is unemployment insurance. They had an unemployment insurance system in which if you lived in a high unemployment area of the country, you could work for as little as eight weeks and get benefits for as many as 40 weeks. And they really started to rein that in. They wanted to have it be harder to get unemployment, have it last less long. And by the way, in thinking that way, they put out, the Treasury put out, or what, what we call the Treasury, uh, 
Finance Department, put out this paper laying out how one of the unintended consequences of unemployment benefits is it encourages people to be unemployed. And that's well recognized in the United States in the economics literature. And I want to quote, show you a quote from, um, ah, I'm going to get this. This is the third time in my life I've made a PowerPoint presentation, but I usually just talk. But there's so many numbers, that there's just no other way, good way to do it. Larry Summers, who I'm sure everyone here has heard of, on unemployment insurance, he said, and by the way, he said this in an article in my Encyclopedia of Economics. That's where this is from. The second way government assistance programs contribute to long-term unemployment is providing an incentive and the means not to work. Each unemployed, person has, each unemployed person has a reservation wage, the minimum wage he or she insists on getting before accepting a job. Unemployment insurance and other social assistance programs increase that reservation wage, causing an unemployed person to remain unemployed longer. So it's well recognized by economists that there's a trade-off there. Yes, you help people out who are out of work, but the you also make them pickier about what kind of job they'll take. Okay, so they, they went through with these cuts. Now one thing they had going for them was that the opposition was from what a party at the time called the Reform Party, which was more conservative than the Liberal Party. So that was the flank they had to worry about, and the Reform Party criticized them for not having big enough cuts. In any case, they did make these cuts, and in 1997, they ran for office and kept the majority right in the middle of the cuts. And then, let's look at Canada's real GDP growth. Here's 93. Uh, here's recovering from the 90, 91 recession, same as our recession. Here's 93. They've started to recover. They start the cuts in a big way in 95. In a small way in 94, notice that there's not much impact of the cuts on reducing growth in 94. Same in 95. 96 is a little low, but then they go to very nice growth. This is real GDP, not nominal, for a number of years. And right there, there's prima facie evidence that budget cuts don't necessarily reduce growth, reduce economic growth. And in fact, I want to just point something out. I was watching... One of the talking head shows a week ago, I think it was Meet the Press with David Gregory, who had on um, two senators, and one was a young guy I didn't recognize. And uh, the way David Gregory asked it was really strange, because he said, what are the painful cuts you're going to make? And I thought, well, I wouldn't have answered that either. Because he's, it's like, when did you stop beating your wife? Right? Well, I don't beat my wife. I, I really don't. Uh, and... Why do the cuts have to be painful? I mean, some of them will be, but let's look for cuts, not for pain. And so it was a real setup kind of question. But notice, anyway, their real GDP growth was quite nice. So by 2000, the Canadian government had large surpluses. And by the way, almost all the cuts in the deficit were on the spending side, not the tax side. They had nickel and dime tax increases in various ways, limiting this deduction, limiting that deduction, and so on, uh, slightly raising marginal tax rates in a, on a small group of people, um, and but very slight, not even the 4.6 percentage points we're talking about here. By 2000, as I said, they had large surpluses, and so they cut tax rates, and they gradually cut corporate tax rates too. From 28% corporate tax rate tax rate at the federal level at the start of all this, they cut it to 21%, and it's now down to 18%, and it's scheduled to fall to 15% by 2012. So Canada is competing for capital. Paul Martin's goal, the finance minister, was to, once they got to a surplus, never let it go. And he had a great line, which I want to... Uh, show you. This is from his memoirs. I call it, take that, John Maynard Keynes. It is important to understand that the no-deficit rule was a sharp break with, break with tradition. 
In the post-war years, many economists argued you did not need to be in the black every year as long as budgets were balanced over the course of the economic cycle. So the deficits during slumps would be paid off with surpluses in good years. Whatever the economic rationale for that approach, it didn't work in the real world of politicians. Once you break the spell, once governments find they can get away with borrowing instead of taxing to pay the bills, it is almost impossibly tempting for politicians to do again and again until the debt is out of control. Richard Wagner and James Buchanan wrote a book called Democracy and Deficit, and I looked in vain in their, that was the message of their book. I looked in vain in their book for a passage that was tight and well stated as that. They said it, but he said it really well. Now, let me just give you a caution. Your results may vary, or maybe I should say your inputs may vary. Let me explain. Canada has a parliamentary system in which the executive and the legislative branch are the same. Once a party takes over, once the party runs the government, it's made up of members of parliament. So the finance minister was a member of parliament. And they tell the bureaucracy what to do, and they pass the legislation. So it's easier. It is easier there than here. I won't deny that. Um, that's the political point. But now the economic point does apply here. It worked. So these arguments we hear about how it's really dangerous to cut spending, um, they aren't borne out in Canada. Dangerous from the viewpoint of the macroeconomy. They aren't borne out in Canada. Now let me turn to something closer to home, although not closer in time, and that is United States after World War II. Because that was an even more dramatic refutation of the Keynesian view of the world. In fact, the way I, the Mercatus asked me to do this longer paper is I'd done the Canada paper and got it to them in July, and then we were on a conference call, and I said, you know, Exhibit A against the Keynesian view of the world is post-World War II America. And they said, tell me how. And I said, here's how, and that's, then I laid it out on this paper. In just four years, government spending Federal government spending as a percent of GNP fell from about 44% to under 10% of GDP. That's a drop of a th over a third of GDP. Now, one thing that's left out in these numbers, transfer payments and interest on the debt, neither of which were very large at the time. But I needed a consistent series that went back to there, and this was the only series I could find. If you have all government spending, it hit about 48, and down here it hit about 13. So it's a similar kind of drop. Now, when you hear there's that kind of drop, and by the way, just um, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer, I, I'm, I'm starting to learn how to talk to young audiences. I mean, everyone my age knows when World War II ended, but sometimes younger people don't. So World War II ended for the United States officially in September 1945. The peak spending year for defense spending was 44. Okay? So there's this dramatic change in about four years. Now, and by the way, I've used the word Keynesian, but again, people have dis disparate backgrounds. Does everyone kind of know what I mean when I use the term Keynes or Keynesian? Does anyone not know and not willing to tell me in front of the others? Okay, I'll just assume you do. Well, okay, I'll just say it really quick. The Keynesian view is that when, that, that government spending is an important driver of the economy. So if you are in a recession, you need to pump up government spending, for example, the stimulus package, for example. And there's not another way to do it. Okay, so that's the Keynesian view. Well, now let's look at what, and Keynesians were becoming very, they were kind of taking over the macroeconomics part of the economics profession from the early 40s to about the early 70s. So this, they had started to take over, and the wunderkind of Keynesian economics was Paul Samuelson at MIT. And here's what he said in 1943. 
Remember, this is two years before the war ends, not even two years, given when he wrote it. When this war comes to an end, more than one out of every two workers will depend directly or indirectly upon military orders. He was roughly right about that. We shall have some 10 million servicemen to throw on the labor market. He was right about that. We shall have to face a difficult reconversion period during which current goods cannot be produced and layoffs may be great. He was right about that. Nor will the technical necessity for reconversion necessarily generate much investment outlay in the critical period under discussion, whatever its later potentialities. The final conclusion to be drawn from our experience at the end of this last, the last war is inescapable. And this, these italics were in his original. Were the war to end suddenly within the next six months, I think if someone had said 18, he wouldn't have quibbled. Were we again planning to wind up our war effort in the greatest haste to demobilize our armed forces, to liquidate price controls, to shift from astronomical deficits to even the large deficits of the 30s, then there would be ushered in the greatest period of unemployment and industrial dislocation which any economy has ever faced. The greatest period of unemployment that any economy has ever faced. Anyone know what the peak unemployment rate was during the Great Depression? 25%. March 1933, 25%. Okay? So he's saying it's going to be worse than that. That's the Keynesian view of the world. Then there was another Keynesian named Gunnar Myrdal, who much later in his life, he was a Swedish economist, but he studied America, much later in his life won the Nobel Prize in economics. And here's what he said. The ec and this is what he said in November 44. The economic uncertainty in America today centers in what is going to happen to this business boom when, one, the federal demand for war materials diminishes and gradually disappears. By the way, it wasn't that gradual, as you saw and central control is replaced by free enterprise. Except for Nazi Germany and Communist Russia, that is, for centrally planned economies, we have no historical precedent for the stabilization of a boom. In an unregulated capitalistic society, it appears that a boom must always have an end and lapse into crisis and depression. How can chaos be avoided once the enormous inflationary pressure and the balancing controls are simultaneously removed? He even, by the way, predicted social unrest and riots. Okay. Well, let's see what happened. And in fact, go back to Samuelson and Samuels, the things Samuelson said were needed to demobilize our armed forces, done. To liquidate price controls, done. And I'll say more about that in a couple minutes. To shift from astronomical deficits to even the large deficits of the 30s, uh, not only done, but more than done. They switched from large deficits to slight surpluses. And, uh, and there's one other, to demobile, um, okay, so that's, where did I, okay, so those three things, right? In other words, were we not to do any of the, were we to do these things, we'd have this mess. So now let's look at what we got. In just the 11 month period, between August 45 and July 46, the number of people in the U.S. military fell from 12 million to 2.7 million, a drop of over 9 million people. Over those same 11 months, civilian unemployment, civilian employment grew from 53.6 to 57.8, an increase of 4.2 million. The number of unemployed people did increase, rising from 0 0.8 million to 2.3 million. But with a civilian labor force of 60.1 million, the 2.3 million unemployed people implied an unemployment rate of only 3.8%. And in fact, in those three years, the unemployment rate never went above 4%. As President Truman said, I think I've got the quote here. At the end of 1946, less than a year and a half after VJ Day, <coughs> victory in Japan, more than 10 million demobilized veterans and other millions of wartime workers have found employment in the swiftest and most gigantic changeover that any nation has ever made from war to peace. In other words, it worked. We didn't have this recession that the Keynesians worried about. In fact, we had a boom. Now, it does raise the issue, why did we have a boom? So let me go into that a little more. <clears throat> 
Uh, and let me just go into one aspect of the boom. Look at the labor reallocation. This isn't as big as I wanted. Um, but there'll be a handout, right, where they, well, actually, uh, will they get a handout? OK. So what I've got up here is just the various categories, the various industries, including government. And I put everyone in terms of full-time employment equivalent, full-time equivalent. And what it shows is a whole bunch of industries laying people off, like armaments, and a whole bunch of industries hiring people in very quick order, very quickly. And so then the question is, why that happened? And really what it was, was we moved from a somewhat centrally planned economy in which the government spent almost one out of every two dollars and regulated the rest to a relatively free market economy. An important part of this story was that, I hate, I, there's no unblunt way to say this, Franklin Roosevelt died. Franklin Roosevelt was a new dealer who tried various ways of regulating the economy. He brought in, they called them the long-haired boys, these people who were very radical and wanted to regulate the whole economy, including, by the way, one of my fellow Canadians, John Kenneth Galbraith, who was put in charge in a very high-level position, deputy director of the Office of Price Administration that, rate, that put price controls on the whole, whole economy. And one of his major acts was to make the sale of new tires illegal. You could not legally buy a new tire in the United States. Uh, and just to give me an idea of how regulated it was, they didn't let Detroit produce any cars. Car production was cut to zero in 1942 from a few million a year. And instead they used it for airplanes, tanks, trucks, and so on. A lot of them needed to be sent to Russia and, of course, to Europe. Um, <clears throat> so we had a very regulated economy, and we had price controls on almost everything. Why do governments impose price controls? They want to be at the front of the queue, get stuff cheap, and then the rest of us get what's left. And once they had price controls and there are shortages, then they have rationing. So they had rationing. Gasoline, tires, sugar, um, no cars, and so on. Meat. So what happened after the war ended? What happened was that there was a huge push, especially on the part of the Republicans, to end price controls. And the uh, uh, Truman wanted to renew the price controls, but the Republicans put them on a short leash. They said, OK, we'll renew them, and the Republicans and, and Democrats. We'll renew them, but they are, there's a time certain that they end, and they aren't as, as universal or as, as extreme as the ones they had. And because Truman didn't get what he wanted, the, he vetoed the bill. So price controls ended on June 30th, 1946. Of course, right away, prices shot up. Prices had been repressed by those price controls. They shot up, and that's going to be a, an important part of a story I'm going to tell in about five minutes. Between mid-June and mid-July, food prices rose by 13%, meat prices by 30%. Now, those don't represent real price increases because price controls on meat and other foods had caused shortages. And in fact, I'll tell you a butcher jo joke that makes the point. Customer goes into a butcher shop. What do you charge for filet mignon? Butcher, $8.99 a pound. Customer, outraged, $8.99 a pound? I can get filet mignon across the street for $7 a pound. Butcher, then why don't you go across the street? Customer, because he doesn't have any filet mignon. Butcher, when I, don't when I don't have any filet mignon, I charge $5 a pound. The point is that prices don't mean much if you can't get the things at those prices. So Congress and Truman responded to those quick price increases by reimposing price controls. The bill that Truman signed in July 46, however, had many exemptions, uh, more checks and balances in the price controls than during wartime, and a sunset clause requiring them to end by June of 1947. Price controls actually ended sooner than that, because when the controls were imposed, we went back to shortages of meat, and people were outraged. And in fact, the Republicans noting the outrage, 
They were led by the guy who at the time was known as Mr. Republican, Senator Robert Taft of Ohio. The Republicans in that election used a two-word slogan, had enough. And they won 57 seats in the House of Representatives, 13 seats in the Senate, and took over both houses. On November 9th, just four days after the election, has stripped his Democratic Party of both majorities, Truman abolished with his discretionary power all remaining price controls except those on rental housing, sugar, and rice. By the way, the book on which I drew on that talks about all these steps doesn't even mention, even in a footnote, that this happened four days after the election. There's a connection there. So why is that important? Because for an economy to work well, you can't have price controls, especially price controls on lots of things. Because price controls prevent resources from being allocated to the best uses, to the highest valued uses. And getting rid of price controls really helped. The other thing is that government spending was, as I mentioned, 45% of GDP. And so cutting that by over 30 percentage points meant that instead of the government being consuming things that are essentially destroyed in wartime, people are able to buy things. And now I think to understand why that's important, we have to get out of this mindset that I think is one of the worst legacies of Keynesian economics. And the mindset is of thinking of GDP as this kind of undifferentiated good. Like, all that matters is GDP, whatever it is. So if you buy a car and then immediately destroy it, guess what? That's in GDP. But which is better, buying a car and immediately destroying it, or buying a car and doing what most of us Americans do, which is take 12 years to destroy it? The second, right? So it really matters what's in GDP. And so what happens? People are demobilized. They come back from the war, and instead of now being soldiers, warriors, they are actually buying stuff they want that they're going to keep, things like houses and cars, and then they're producing things that other people want. So that's, it's those reasons, getting rid of price controls, getting rid of government as the purchaser of half the goods in the economy, it's those things that account for why the economy did so well. And now let's sort of look at a few uh, data points on that. Again, this doesn't come out as well as I'd like. Gross private domestic investment, this is in constant dollars. In 1941, really the last peacetime year, it's 44.4 billion. 42, it falls in half, almost, and just goes slightly above half of that in 44, the low half of that in 45, and then look at 46, 51.7 billion, 51.8 billion, and so on. So private domestic investment booms. And now let's look at the percentage growth of real private GN GDP. Uh, there's the depression there. There's the recovery. There's the, mini the recession inside the recession, the double dip. There's the wartime. Uh, there's, the, uh, there's private GDP, the first big year of war. Of course, it's lower because government's doing everything. And then here's the recovery. Okay. Um, and then, finally, let's look at consumer durables. This is from an old report I found. Output of consumer durables. Um, this is, you can see uh, cars, passenger automobiles, trucks, battery, well, batteries didn't do much. Mechanical refrigerators, people buying fridges. That was a big deal back then. You know where the term ice box comes from? They have the ice on top. And Cold, cold air falls, okay? So getting a refrigerator was a big deal. Washing machines and ironers, they called them ironers, that's irons, vacuum cleaners, electric ranges, sewing machines, radios, all booming. So we have unemployment under 4%. We have a boom in consumer purchases, a boom in private investment. So again, a real success story, and a much quicker success story than I think than even probably the optimists thought. Now, let me look for a few minutes at the popular explanations for this. The first is what I call 
Rosie the Riveter goes home. And the idea was, well, of course, all these guys coming back from the war found their jobs because we had all these women working in defense plants and they went back to being in the household. That story is half true and totally misleading for two reasons. First of all, half of the additional women who entered the labor force at the start of the war stayed. So only half went home. So you have roughly two million of them going home and 10 million men coming back. So that can't account for much of it. Moreover, people say, well, they, they kept their jobs in the defense plans. What defense plans? We had a massive demobilization, so they had to find different work also. So again, an amazingly quick readjustment. The second is the GI Bill. People say, oh, well, of course we didn't have a massive unemployment problem with returning soldiers because so many of them went to college. The numbers don't fit. Again, 10 million people came back from the war. At the peak usage of the GI Bill, which was immediately in 1946, only 800,000 took advantage of it to go to college. So 8% of those returning people. And so if you'd said, oh, all of them would have been unemployed, the unemployment rate would have been about a percent, 1.4 percentage points higher. Still would have been a healthy, low unemployment rate. The third one, there are two parts to it. I, I put down one part. The, the, the one thing we often hear, and this was, the Keynesians were stunned by this. So they're looking around for, well, why did this happen? And so they came up with this idea of pent-up demand. You had all that rationing during the war. You had people not being able to buy cars. And then they want to buy cars. They want to buy houses. They want to buy nylon stockings, which had just come along before the war. They wanted to buy tires, which are now legal to buy, all those things. That argument isn't totally wrong, but there's a piece of it that is totally wrong. And the piece has to do with savings. The argument made is, because people couldn't buy things during the war, they had a huge buildup of their savings. And that is true. Then the argument goes, they drew down their savings to buy this stuff, and that part is false. Why do I say that? Savings are what economists call a stock. Saving is a flow. So if you save 5% of your income, let's take someone making uh, $50,000 who saves 5% of his or her income. So you're saving $2,500. At the end of the year, are your savings higher or lower than at the start of the year? It's not a trick question. What are they? Someone said it. What's the answer? Higher, right? Whatever you start with at the start of the year, you save 5%. So you've saved 2500 this year. Your savings are $2,500 higher. So if the saving rate is still positive, in other words, if people are saving a particular percent of their income, their savings at the end of the year are going to be higher. And that's, in fact, what happened. So this drawdown of savings didn't happen at all. People's saving rate fell, the percent of their income they saved, but their saving was positive, which means their savings grew. Their stock of savings grew. So it wasn't the case that they were running down this stock of saving. OK, well, finally, what about the view and I've actually seen some bloggers went after me on this when the piece came out. They said this. They said, you know what? Henderson missed the fact that we did have a recession in 1946. If you, and if you look at official government data, by the way, I handled this in the paper and I went on as a commenter and said, hey, you can read the whole paper. <laughs> the official government data show that 1946 was the worst year ever in the US economy. Real GDP fell by 12%. So what's Henderson doing saying we had this great boom? Well, the way I, I titled it in my piece, and an editor at uh, Mercatus thought this was too snarky, I guess, but the title of that little section was, was what are you going to believe, the data or your own lying eyes? 
Because if you talk to anyone, and of course I did when I was growing up, who lived through that time, everyone thought it was a boom. Everyone thought it was a boom. Now, why do people think it wasn't? Because they're looking at this official data. But what's wrong with the data? How do, you, how do you value wartime production? It's not sold in a market. And it's destroyed. So if people are just not able to get cars because they're going to go over to Europe and then just be shot, shot up, or trucks or jeeps or whatever shot up, and now they can get cars, that's better. And in fact, one other interesting thing that's not in the paper that I learned later, that every time the Bureau of Economic Analysis and the Department of Commerce updates their baseline, the 1946 recession gets worse. That it's 12% now. Next time they update it, it'll maybe be 13. When they first did it, it was something like an 8% drop because it all has to do with the baseline. It's an index number problem. The real fact is the economy was booming. And again, just to emphasize why. Because people are able to buy and sell. People are able to exchange. And so you get rid of price controls and exchanges happen. You get government out of the business of buying stuff and let people produce and buy things that other people want. Then they do that. And I think one of the major messages is don't think of the economy as this aggregate of mass GDP or GNP. Think of it because it's not an aggregate, really. It's millions and millions of transactions and thousands of millions of, well, that's billions, of, tran, uh, 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 sorry, millions of transa transactors and billions of transactions. And they're all happening because people are buying and selling things other people want to sell or buy. So what have I accomplished with these two studies? I think I've shown two major things. You can have major cuts in government spending without throwing the economy into recession. In Canada and the United States, post-World War II, you had a boom. And you can make those cuts and not lose elections. So I know there's a lot of talk with the Deficit Commission, with everything happening in Washington, with the new Congress coming in, about what we can or can't do. And my major, um, my major message here is to coin a phrase that was used in another context, yes, we can. Thank you. <laughs> and we have time for questions, right? I got one. Oh, okay. Earlier, you were talking about um, in uh, Canada, in which there was uh, growth, I guess, throughout the 90s, um, and there was also a lot of spending cuts. Uh, you know, in the United States, there was also, this is a pretty prosperous time in, in right. the U.S., as, as I recall. It was. Uh, you know, driven a lot by, you know, the economy doing well, a lot of, you know, tax base increasing, a lot of revenues coming in. So how much in Canada was the, uh, was the success in Canada attributed to a boom of the economy writ large versus the spending cuts? That's a really good question. And by the way, in the interest of time, I didn't have something in my talk, but it is in my paper. Well, raising the questions in my paper, and I go through some of the facts, and it's really hard to distinguish, but let me make the argument that you might make, which is that Canada got the free trade agreement with the United States in 88, but got NAFTA in 93, just at the start of all this, 93 or 4, and so, you know, free trade is good. Free trade helps an economy, all other things equal. So that certainly could, was a piece. Moreover, contrary to popular belief, America's major trading partner is not China, it's Canada, has been for a long time, and China's a distant second. And so, yeah, that certainly was, was a factor. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but one thing that's interesting is, um, I think uh, I can do this. Let's see. Um, if you look at, let's go back to that um, 
GDP growth. It's not, that's not the only story. And here's, here's one thing that says that. Look at growth in 2001, 2002 when the United States has a recession. So it's not just that. And that's when they've had the budget cuts. Almost all of them have been implemented by then. Well, given that I'm not seeing any other questions, I got one. Uh, and of course, it works best if you're honest. How persuaded are you? By what I'm saying. Like, budget cuts. And my major message isn't whether you should favor budget cuts. I think you should. My major message is budget cuts aren't, it, it is not the case that when you cut budgets, you're necessarily going to put the economy in a bad situation. How persuaded are you of that particular thing? And if you're not, you'll have a better discussion if you tell me that. Yes? Okay, that's fine. Yes, absolutely. And um, I spent a lot of time in my hotel room yesterday and uh, was channel surfing. And I love watching House Commons question time. And so I was seeing, you know, um, a really young guy who's kind of, who's head of the Labor Party, I've forgotten his name, really putting the Prime Minister David Cameron on the spot. And we will have a test. Those are serious budget cuts, and we will have a test. And let me also emphasize, I ju it was just a line or two in my piece, so um, but just, let me just emphasize it again, that the U.S. government spending fell in the 90s from 22% of GDP to 18% of GDP. So half of that roughly was defense cuts, and half of it roughly was domestic spending, not domestic spending cuts, but domestic spending not going up as much as GDP went up. And so we even have our own little story here from the 90s, which was a good, a good era. And in a way, that's further evidence, because notice we were doing it here, and we didn't have this major recession. Didn't even have a recession at all, uh, other than this just short one in the early 90s. Yes? You covered a little bit of politics, so uh, the budget cuts in Canada. How were um, the first of all, you know, were uh, the Warren Martin and Yeah. They Yeah. They were attacked politically. I don't know if they used the kill children thing. I mean, it's amazing, I mean, given that I'm from Canada, how ignorant I was of what was going on until I started researching this. Uh, so I went up there every summer to my cottage and I just didn't know this was happening in in the in the to the extent it was. But I was there for a couple of the elections. Uh, just one of them was in the 2004. I was there. It was in the summer, and I don't. Rem that was not talked about, and this was you know well along. Um, the big upset. I happened to run when I was going back to my cottage this summer. I'm a very nosy person sometimes, so I look at this guy who's really well dressed in the Denver airport. Well, how often does that happen anymore? Flying right. So I look and I see this little Canadian thing on his, and I recognize his name. He's the Canadian ambassador to the United States, and he was the uh, the premier in, in the province I grew up in, Gary Gary Dewar. And so I said, "Excuse me, are you Gary Dewar?" He goes, "Yeah." So uh, I said, "I told him about this paper I just finished," and he said, "Well, you know, Paul Martin did it the easy way." And I said, well, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, he cut transfers to the provinces, and of course that was in my paper. He did, and so that was the big objection: was the provinces screaming, but the provinces there, kind of like the states here." They don't have literally, I think, a balanced budget requirement, but they got a lot less flexibility in, in debts, in debt. And so they adjusted. And you didn't have the actual stories of people starving. They were really well-fashioned cuts. They kept the safety net, but they, if you were above a certain income level, it got phased, various things got phased out. When I grew up in Canada, there was something called the child allowance. And my father put aside the $8 a month check for each of us three kids, which was turned into our college fund. And and, you know, with interest, it was a bigger number than it sounds like. And uh, so what they did was they phased out the, the child allowance based on your income. They called it clawback, which I think is a great expression. 
<laughs> you know, and, and so again, a lot of people not getting those transfers who were, but it's very thought through. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, you. <laughs> oh, I see. Given the uh, Canadian experience of six to seven dollars of spending cuts for each dollar of tax increase, you know, how would you apply that to uh, your thinking on the uh, deficit reduction commission's report? But I'd like to see roughly the same ratio, and I think, and I haven't looked at it carefully. That's a good question, by the way. I haven't looked at it carefully, but my impression is they're not close to that. In other words, I think their tax increases are a much bigger percentage of the overall deficit. Yes. It's what? If it were five to one and I really believed it, I would say it was good. I guess I got to say I want to look at the numbers more carefully. I'm really skeptical of that. Um, and the other thing I think you got to be careful about is are the tax increases the sure things and the budget cuts further down the road and we hope they happen. Uh, that when I was in the Reagan administration, that's what happened in, in 82 when Reagan agreed to a tax increase and the other side, and by the way, the other side wasn't just Democrats, it was some Republicans too, really didn't come through with the, with the budget cuts they promised up front. So that's, that's a big concern. Sir? It seems like the the, uh, the disagreement or difficulty comes in identifying where those spending cuts should and, and occur. In fact, you know, very often it's difficult to come up with a top ten list. I'm just wondering if you can comment on that in light of kind of what you've outlined here, um, in terms of like perhaps identifying, you know, particular places to start, particular areas to focus. Um, um, areas that are going to have the largest impact sort of in the most, you know, in the most expedient way. So in other words, just so I understand before you give up the microphone, uh, you're saying what would I like to see cut or is that what you're asking? Because I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'd like to see that too. Okay. But what was that too? So what was the other thing? I, I think probably that's more what I'm Okay. Saying. Okay. And, and in I... In light of that fact, I, I think there's a difficulty in dropping. Yeah. Right. Okay, I'll, let me make a general statement and then I'll talk about specifics. The general statement is, the, contrary to what you might first think, the more, you cut, the more places you cut and the bigger those percentage cuts, the better. Because what you start setting up is a dynamic where people start fighting each other to keep their piece of it rather than just fighting you. If you name two or three or four things, it's very easy for those interest groups to get together and fight those things off. But you can get this different dynamic going. And I remember when Reagan and Stockman came up with the first budget in 81, and it was pretty aggressive. Um, I remember watching CBS News one night, and they interviewed this tobacco farmer who was really upset about the cut in tobacco subsidies. But then he said, but you know, if other people are giving up their special programs too, I guess I can pitch in and do mine. So that's a different dynamic. Now having said that, I would like to get the United States government out of Iraq and Afghanistan. That would save approximately $150 billion a year if they didn't redeploy them to Iran or something, right? In other words, if they actually got out. Um, I would like, and you're going to learn my ideology as I go here, but there's no other way of avoiding it. I'd like to end the TSA. I would, and, and I can, I can make cases for all these things. Um, I would, I would like to end the Department of Education. Uh, you know, they're, they're just thing after thing, farm subsidies, thing after thing that I think there's a really good case for getting rid of. The ethanol program, which now Al Gore admits was a bad idea, but he said he had to do it to win in Iowa. So, you know, they're just, they're just all these places to cut. I can't think of, and let's put it a different way, I can't think of any budget that shouldn't be cut substantially. And then the question is percentages. Yes. 
Right. Um, so that's kind of like fear. Right. And that's really the, that was the main reason for giving this talk. To say, I don't think that fear is justified because look at the evidence. Well, it seems like it's mainly that Christianity hasn't Right. Well, but remember, that's what I was saying. What's happening in the United States as, you, as Canada's doing this cuts? The United States is cutting. They start in 91 with government spending being 22% of GDP. In 2001, I think it is, it's 18% of GDP. So the United States is cutting too, just not as much. In fact, you know what's really striking? If you talk to a Keynesian, and the Keynesian says, um, no, we shouldn't cut government spending during a recession or during a weak recovery, ask that Keynesian to give you two instances where cutting clearly caused a recession, or even two instances where raising spending with stimulus plans actually worked. It's very hard to find it. They got this theoretical model, works in the model by, because of their assumptions. It's hard to find a real example. I say two because they might come up with one, right? But you want more than one sample point behind your views. <laughs>